Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 18th of February and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 21st of February with me Michael Hewson and it's been another week of choppy equity markets, another week of uncertainty, market declines, claims and counterclaims between Russia and NATO about the size and movement of Russian forces on the Ukraine border. On Wednesday, we saw a market rally on the back of claims by Russia that it was removing some of its forces from the Ukrainian border. Um, this narrative was pushed back on by the US, um, basically saying that that wasn't actually happening and actually the reverse was, happen was happening. Russia's continued to deny that it is increasing the size of its forces. Um, and then on Thursday, we had reports of shelling and firing on a village in eastern Ukraine by pro-Russian forces, which hasn't exactly helped sentiment either. Those same forces have blamed Ukraine for the shelling. And obviously, this is important, I think, in the overall context of what happens next. Um, it's becoming increasingly clear that the US and NATO appears to think a Russian invasion is only a matter of time whether it comes this week or in a few days. US officials, I think, want it to be clear that if and when it does happen, Russia won't be able to hide behind a false flag event to justify. And I think that's what drove an awful lot of the declines that we saw on Thursday. The pro-Russian forces in eastern Ukraine could potentially have been trying to go to response from the Ukrainian army, giving the Russians a pretext to invade. So there's an awful lot of propaganda going on. Obviously, it makes it very, very difficult to make long term investment decisions. But in terms of trading, um, it, uh, it, it does offer opportunity from a trading perspective. And certainly if we look at the FTSE 100 this week, um, we have seen some declines, some notable um, some, some, of the, some of the more notable things have been a decline in oil prices, which does seem a little bit counterintuitive when the possibility that Russia could invade Ukraine could potentially send oil prices up to $100 a barrel. Um, there has been talk that the talks between Iran um, and, uh, and the US are going well with respect to the resumption of Iranian production to the oil market, and maybe that is having a downward effect on crude oil prices, but inventories still remain tight. And even if Iranian crude does come back onto the market, that's not gonna happen overnight. So, you know, I think while we're seeing a little bit of a decline in oil prices, it's probably long overdue. We've seen eight successive weeks of gains, so at some point we were gonna get a decline. $100 a barrel still remains the magnetic force or, ma or maintains a magnetic pull, I think. And some of the inflation data that we've seen uh, this week would appear to suggest that there's no prospect of a slowdown in inflationary pressures going forward. UK PPI numbers saw input prices rise again in January to 9.9%, and there was an expect and there was an expectation that they would fall. Um, so upward pressure on UK CPI is expected to continue. Some of it's going to be self-inflicted in terms of tax rises in April. Um, we see the head we saw headline CPI rise to 5.5%. And in the coming week, we've got US core PCE. And I think that could be a very important number as we look ahead to next week. Um, certainly in terms of looking ahead to next week, there are, a number of, there are a number of items I've got my eye on. Obviously, that's the main macro one. We've also got fourth quarter GDP from the US, the second iteration. We've got flash PMIs from France, Germany and the UK. Um, and um, uh, we've also got US personal spending and income as well. We also have the beginning of bank earnings, UK bank earnings. We got off to a very good start today, Friday, with NatWest and very decent numbers there. Annual profits of just shy of £3 billion. 
um, 750 million share buyback and um, a seven and a half P final dividend. So not too shabby. Um, that probably won't be the narrative that the, the media leads with. It'll be about bonuses. And to be quite honest, I find the subject of bonuses, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky subject. It's a tricky subject, but um, I'll come on to them in a minute. For the here and now, let's have a look at the main indices. FTSE 100 continues to make new highs. Um, we saw a high last Thursday, 7,680. We have since dropped back. We've got fairly decent support in and around 7,480. Um, the, the biggest support, I think, for me still remains in and around 7,400. Yeah, we did see a little bit of a uh, spike below it there. But more broadly, we've managed to hold above the 50-day moving average in terms of the long-term uptrend. And even if we do fall below it, we've still got the 200-day moving average here. But there does appear to be some evidence of a potential um, pause starting to take place. We've seen a marginally higher high. Um, and I think as long as we're able to stay above uh, this series of lows through here, um, there, there could be potentially a bit of a potential head and shoulders starting to form. We really want to we really want to take out this peak um, from early this month on the 10th of February to keep the upward momentum intact. So I'd like to see a move back above 7,600 and a retest of these highs. Otherwise, we could see a little bit of a consolidation over the course of the rest of the quarter. Um, in terms of the DAX, it's the same old story, I'm afraid. We still, we still have fairly decent support in and around these spike lows through here. But as you can see from these spike lows through here, there's fairly decent demand below 15,000 for German equities. That being said, the peaks are getting lower. So there does appear to be an element of waning momentum. And that does make me a little bit cautious in the short to medium term. I really want to see a break of this 15,600 to have slightly more confidence that we're going to go back higher again. So keep an eye on this 15,000 level. Look for a close below there um, for potential for further losses. But for the time being, we still remain, I still remain probably more broadly positive than negative when it comes to the DAX. S&P 500, daily chart, same with the NASDAQ. We haven't retested the January lows, and that is encouraging because it does appear to suggest, despite all the volatility, that the upside potential still remains intact. Um, that being said, we've seen US 10-year yields rise even further this week. Let me pull that in for you. But we do appear to be finding a little bit of a top in and around this 2.1% area, 206, 205. Um, so you know, are, are we seeing a little bit of a top here? It's hard to say because we could have made the same argument here. So it's a little bit of a top here. We traded sideways and then we then we thrust higher. So there is potential for us to go higher. I think much will depend on this week's core PCE. We've heard an awful lot of chatter about inverted yield curves. Certainly, I think um, the the flattening of the curve does appear to suggest that there is a risk that the market fears the Fed could be about to make a policy mistake. But on the flip side of that, we are still seeing much higher than expected inflation. And this week, I think this is why this week's core PCE numbers will be extremely important. This week's Fed minutes suggested that there was a quorum of Fed policymakers who were reluctant to consider anything other than a 25 basis point hike next month. Well, obviously, that seems a fairly reasonable interpretation of the data as it was at the time. And that's why we saw a little bit of a softening in US yields yesterday. We can see that on this chart here. We had a bit of a sell-off. Now, part of that sell-off in yields and that bid in US treasuries was also, I think, a consequence of a significantly risk-off tone to market. So you get a little bit of, you had a little bit of a bid in US treasuries and a rotation out of equities into US treasuries on haven buying. 
So there is an element of haven buying going on um, in, US, in the US Treasury market, which is counteracting the upward pressure on yields. So we do need to be aware of that. Nonetheless, the debate has moved on quite a bit when it comes to um, whether or not the Fed moves in March or whether it moves 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Now, we've heard an awful lot of noise from St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, um, who's been calling for a 50 basis point rate hike in March and another 50 by July. Um, he seems to have got an ordinarily large amount of airtime over the course of the past few weeks. And as such, that means that he's able, been able to pretty much um, put his case without any significant pushback apart from, say, for example, Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed. Now, of course, much will depend on how um, events in Ukraine and Russia on the Ukraine-Russia border play out over the course of the next week or so. But I think there is cause for optimism there. Um, Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is due to meet Sergei Lavrov, um, the Russian foreign minister, sometime next week. So if those talks are to go anywhere, then the situation on the ground in Ukraine um, sh hopefully will calm down over the course of the next few days. We've got a US bank holiday on Monday, so that could temper market activity in the early part of the week, assuming that we don't get any unexpected surprises over the weekend. But overall, I think absent any concerns about geopolitics. This week's core PCE numbers, which are due out on the 25th, a week today, um, what should give us a good insight as to whether or not the, the market could start to price in the possibility of a 50 basis point hike in March. Now, there are plenty of reasons to think that the, the Fed won't go 50. They won't want to surprise the market. But the inflation picture, whatever you think of it, is starting to become much more ingrained. Now, you can argue the case, and many people do, that there's not much the Fed can do about rises in commodity prices, and that is certainly very true. Um, but it certainly needs to send a message that it's not underestimating the challenge that inflation will cause, not only to um, inflation expectations, but um, it's a credibility when it comes to fighting it. So um, that's why when we look at the other data that we've seen since the last Fed minutes, we've seen US CPI come in at 7.5%. We've seen US PPI rise sharply. Um, we've seen a fairly decent payrolls report. January numbers very, very strong. US GDP at around about 7% and a very strong retail sales number. So if you're going to shift your thinking from 25 to 50, one or all of them is, mount, is bound to make you think, well, maybe we should go 50 basis points just to send a message, see how the market reacts, and then see whether or not we need to do another 25, 50 going forward. There's been plenty of people suggesting that sending a message on 50 could be the way to go. Now, the Fed may not do that. But if you get core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure, core PCE deflator, which is the Fed's preferred measure going through 5%, which is well over double its target for inflation, then I think market thinking could evolve in a manner that could make 50 basis points a real probability, a real possibility. So we can't rule that out. We've also got personal spending and income for January. Judging by the real strong retail sales number that we saw earlier this week, that's likely to see a big jump in US personal spending. Now, the original estimate for that was 0.6% and a rise in personal income by 0.5%. If both or either of those are very, very strong, then, of course, the calculus will once again shift to the possibility of a 50 basis point rate hike in March. So, um, the key levels on the S&P remain the same. This 61.8 Fibonacci retracement from this down move here is the big resistance on the upside. So it's 45.90, 4,600. It's also the 50-day moving average. It's a huge level. It's a huge level, that. Um, that's been the extent of the rebound of the January lows.
So if we are to move back higher, we need to take out that level as long as we stay above the January lows. Let's look at the NASDAQ. Um, again, January lows here. Let's do some Fibonacci retracements on this particular move and do that. There we go. And again, 61.8, quite a bit higher. Interesting to see that the NASDAQ rebound hasn't been in any way near as significant as the S&P rebound. So let's knock out those two. Don't really need them. Done. There we go. So we've got 50% on the NASDAQ, 15,190. That's the key resistance level going forward. So let's knock that out there. So those are the key resistances on the major market indices. Euro dollar, same resistance level 114.85 that's the big level on the upside on the downside we've got around about 112.70 and obviously we also have those lows back in late January of around about 111.20 so decent support in and around 112.79 112.80 you can you can catch up on my you can catch up on my my analysis on that on the forums button which is there you can see it on the left hand side i update that on a on a fairly regular basis at least three or four times a week so that is worth keeping an eye out for cable cable does appear to be finding a bit of a foothold above 136 it is starting to run into resistance around about 136.70 we've also got the 200 day moving average um, it is starting to look better bid an expectation of a potential rate hike in March from the Bank of England, and certainly this week's inflation numbers would appear to suggest that is the direction of travel when it comes for interest rates, given the fact that we're probably likely to be above 7% by the time we get to April, and the Bank of England may well want to get out in front of that, um, that particular number. So 136.70, um, we're above 136 this resistance level here and the 200 day moving average keep an eye out for that particular move there then we've got euro sterling again the direction of travel um, still remains towards the downside i think it really does depend on whether or not the ecb continues to double down on the expectation that they're reluctant to hike rates this year i think what we do need to get a guidance on is its bond buying program because I think they've come out and said that they will only consider hiking rates after the asset purchase program is finished. There is talk of that might end in August or September. It'll be interesting to see whether or not we get any further clarity on the timeline of the end of the bond buying program. But until such time as we do, it's likely to continue, Euro sterling is likely to continue to range towards the downside and the lows that we saw back at the end of January and the beginning of February. So what are we looking at this week? Well, we've got UK banks. That's the big topic for this week. Big week for UK banks. NatWest Group posted its best set of four year numbers in years today. Um, last year's profits were weighed down by loan loss provisions and negative interest rate concerns. This year has seen those provisions largely unwound and rates go up, putting the banks in the strongest position they've been in for over 10 years. So um, going to be looking at Barclays, Lloyds and HSBC. Of course, higher profits will inevitably prompt the inevitable pearl clutching about bonuses. Now, obviously, it's not a particularly good look if banks are paying out huge amounts in bonuses when the cost of living is exacting the worst squeeze on living standards in years. You know, it's never a good one. And it's likely to prompt further calls for windfall taxes on banks. But banks already pay higher rates of tax in the form of a tax surcharge on top of the current corporation tax rate anyway. So they're already paying a windfall tax. Um, and that's before the boost to the exchequer that higher profits and bonuses bring. You know, I think myself, you know, no one likes to see people getting doing well and getting more than they do but ultimately if banks are making profits and bonuses are getting paid that's more tax that's more tax to the exchequer at a time 
when the US, the UK Treasury needs as much as much in the way of tax receipts as it can get. Uh, and I think it's good that banks are finally acting as a net contributor to the Exchequer rather than being a drain. It's about time they paid all that taxpayer funded bailout back. Um, I'm not really that interested in about how they do it as long as they do it and they do it legally, of course. Um, so we've got we're going to start with Barclays very much in an uptrend. We've seen a little bit of weakness in NatWest share price the last time that I look in the back of their numbers. And as we've seen from uh, this year's performance in the Barclays share price, we've seen a bit of a pullback here as well. Um, so there is a little bit of profit taking heading into the numbers. I think that's largely to be expected. The performance, the decent performance has been priced in. And obviously a flat yield curve doesn't exactly help matters when it comes to future bank profitability. And maybe there's a perception that while last year is probably going to be a fairly good year for banks, they could struggle to match that when it comes to this year. So there's certainly a little bit of concern that maybe we could get a little bit of a pullback to this sort of area through here. So keep keep an eye on um, Barclays share price. We've got a new CEO now, um, now that Jess Staley has gone. Uh, new CEO is CS Venkata Krishnan, or Venkat, as he likes to be known. Um, Q3, pre-tax profits rose to one and a half billion for Barclays, adding to the 4.9 billion seen in the first half of this year. Now the bank announced at the time a 500 million share buyback, a dividend of 2p per share. Q4 profits are expected to come in at a similar level to Q3, pushing full year profits above eight billion pounds. So that's not too shabby. Looking for impact on business lending. That was a little bit weak in that, in that West's Q4 numbers. It's not altogether surprising given the challenges facing businesses over the course of the past 12 months. Um, I'll certainly be looking to see um, what the outlook is in terms of consumer um, consumer lending as well, but I would imagine that will probably be skewed by mortgage lending. So looking, looking for fairly decent numbers from Barclays, the bigger question is whether or not we'll see a little bit of a pullback in the share price. As a consequence of that, similarly, Lloyds Banking Group as well, done very well over the course of the past 12 months. Um, there does appear to be a little bit of a similar pullback in the share price from the highs that we saw earlier this earlier this year. Um, has resumed the dividend in July last year. Lloyd's raised its outlook for the year, recording statutory pre-tax profits um, in the first half to 3.9 billion pounds. So the hope is that um, they will be equally as good in the second half. The expectation is for 7.2 billion pounds in profits. Um, and again, it's probably going to raise the temperature when it comes to bonuses um, as well. But a similar sort of narrative when it comes to Lloyd's looking at business lending, looking at um, consumer lending. And obviously, with respect to Lloyd's, they don't have a big investment banking division. So I would imagine the big profits for Lloyd's probably aren't going to be susceptible to the same sort of um, criticism, perhaps, than maybe Barclays, who have a, have a significant investment banking division and are able to diversify their income streams as a consequence of that. We've also got four year numbers from HSBC. Before I do that, let's just quickly draw a trend line on this Lloyd's chart. There we go. So it comes in round about the 200 day moving average. So we're basically heading back towards our long term uptrend. Personally, of all the banks, Lloyd's to me looks the most um, promising in terms of further upside potential, particularly when you consider that it's still well below pre-pandemic levels. So for me, given the fact that it's done as well as it has, it really need, it really should be back up here somewhere. Um, and I'm sort of really struggling to understand why that it isn't, but hey-ho, what do I know? HSBC being a significant outperformer. Those numbers are due out on the 22nd. Um, the shares have gone from strength to strength since it reported its Q3 numbers. 
Um, Q3 profits after tax rose to $4.2 billion, taking total profits year to date to $12.66 billion. Um, so in line with a lot of other banks, lending was subdued during Q3 with a fall in net loans and advances to customers. Now that's a trend that could well have continued in Q4 with the spread of Omicron, particularly for a bank that generates half of its profits in Asia. The current zero COVID approach of Chinese authorities could act as a drag. Nonetheless, profits for this year have already exceeded all of last year when they came in at 8.8 .8 billion. So this year's profits are expected to come in in the region of around about $18 billion, which is around about 13 billion pounds. So again, um, some fairly decent numbers there, but again, we're still below the levels we are pre-pandemic, but we've come we've come back quite a bit over the course of the past few weeks. We're going to finish up with Rolls-Royce because that has been basically one of the one of the stocks has been absolutely clobbered the hardest due to the fact that um, it gets around about 50% of its revenues from the airlines for engine flying hours. Um, it struggled to meet its target of 55% of engine flying hours of 2019 levels. That being said, it's slowly been clawing its way back. It's found progress a bit tricky over the course of the past few months. It is their four year numbers. It's done a number of, it's managed to bolster its balance sheet. It's got, it's managed to sell two billion pounds of disposals, including the sale of ITP Aero for 1.7 billion euros. That's expected to complete in the first half of this year. It's managed to uh, leverage its small modular reactor business, um, nuclear reactors, mobile reactors, getting 210 million pounds from the British government on top of the 145 million pounds of private investment. Business diversification continued in December with an 85 million pound deal with Qatar to build new low carbon and nuclear power plants. And it's also announced that the company's power systems unit is developing MTU engines that will be able to use eco-friendly methanol fuel for shipping. Um, and it's also signed a defense deal with the Pentagon 1.9 billion pounds for its F-130 engines, which will be used to power the B-52 Strato Fortress for the next 30 years. So it is making progress in diversifying its business away from civil aviation. Um, but I, it would be a surprise if it hits its four-year target at 55% of 2019 levels for 2021, given obviously what happened in January although we have seen the return of transatlantic travel and Australian travel could, is set to resume or did resume on the 8th of February. So the outlook looks a lot more promising for Rolls-Royce than it did six months ago. From the US, we've got Home Depot and Madonna, um, but I won't spend too much time talking about them. I'm going to finish up with Gold, gold and crude oil. Gold looks as if it's going to retest its previous peaks of June 2021, um, around about 1920. It's um, certainly going to find it very difficult to crack that particular nut. And I think I just continue to think that it's likely to continue to range trade. Now, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, I talked about potential for an oil reversal. That, in fact, did not happen. But the key thing about this potential reversal is that it was never confirmed. We never really broke below the lows of that particular candle there, which was $90 a barrel. So the fact that we didn't move below $90 a barrel when that potential reversal pattern didn't take, so it didn't, didn't pan out. Now we've come back again. We posted a marginal new high here and we've come back down again. We squeeze back up, come back down. The big, I think, support level for Brent is likely to be in and around this level here. So we're looking, if we are going to break lower on Brent, we really need to see a confirmed push below $90 a barrel. And even if we do, we're probably going to go only go back to around about 85 and this sort of area around about 
here going forward. So there does appear to be the beginnings of a potential top in place for Brent. But even if we do break lower, I can't see us moving much below 85 or 80 dollars a barrel in the short to medium term, given how tight inventories are at the moment. So it sort of brings me neatly back to um, the end of the presentation. Once again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've um, I hope you've all had a profitable week, and I hope you all have a profitable weekend. It's blowing an absolute gale outside my window right now. I'm surprised you actually can't hear the wind howling outside. Um, so after what has been a really turbulent week and a choppy week, the weather outside is probably a good uh, a good metaphor of how the markets have been this week. Let's hope they're a little bit calmer next week. Hope you all have a great weekend and speak to you same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for listening.